All right, we should uh, maybe get started. I'll do a quick introduction for Nancy. So I'm very happy to have uh, Nancy here lecturing in our school. Um, Nancy is at the University of Rochester in the US and she has done very interesting work uh, on understanding inbreeding and relatedness with uh, wild bird populations, um, as well as other aspects of using pedigrees to understand how uh, breeding um, and behavioral behaviors associated with breeding are impacting the genomics of different populations. And so she does a lot of different work to do with uh, aspects of genome evolution as well. Um, so happy to have Nancy here and unhappy that she's not here in person, but you know, that's how it goes. Uh, so welcome Nancy and, and please start. And everybody, um, Nancy is happy to take questions in between. So please interrupt or raise your hands uh, when you have something to clarify. Okay, Nancy. All right, thank you, Deepa. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry I can't be there in person. So today I thought we would um, focus on talking about concepts of relatedness and inbreeding and how to estimate relatedness and inbreeding, since these are two really important concepts in population genetics and especially conservation genomics. So, oh, okay. How do I advance? All right. So. As you all probably know by now, one of the central goals of population genetics is to understand the processes that change allele frequencies, right? So how important are things such as selection, drift, gene flow, mutation, and changing allele frequencies in our population over time? So we often, um, to study, make these inferences, we go out to natural populations and sample individuals and survey patterns of genetic variation in order to make inferences about the processes that created them. But something to keep in mind is that in natural populations, what's really happening is that there are different individuals living in a population. These individuals are moving around on the landscape. Some individuals die, some individuals survive, and some individuals reproduce. And what this means is that different individuals have different genetic contributions to the population over time, and allele frequencies change because um, different, there's variation in individual genetic contributions to a population over time. And so what this means is that many population and quantitative genetic concepts actually rely on looking at relatedness among individuals. All individuals are related to one another by varying levels of relatedness or kinship, and you can learn a lot about um, evolutionary processes by studying kind of levels of relatedness among individuals through time um, in a population. So that's kind of why I thought we would start by just going over kind of basic um, concepts of what a pedigree is, kind of how to calculate relatedness among individuals or relatedness within individuals or inbreeding. So let's, to start, let's just make sure everybody um, has a basic understanding of how to read and look at pedigrees. Um, so here I'm showing you an example of three generation pedigrees. Uh, typically, um, male individuals are shown with a square, females are shown with a circle, um, and diamonds show individuals whose sex is unknown or irrelevant. Um, the horizontal lines connect mating pairs and vertical lines connect um, parents with children. So related individuals can share alleles that have both descended from a shared common ancestor and in order to be shared, these alleles must be inherited through all of the meioses connecting the two individuals, right? So if you remember basic biology, right, each individual passes on half of their genome um, to each offspring. And so there's like a one half probability that you inherit a particular allele from each parent. Um, so as closer relatives right, are separated by fewer meioses, closer relatives tend to share more alleles. And so the key kind of two key definitions here are identity by state versus identity by descent. So identity by state um, refers to identical nucleotide individuals. So if you're sequencing two different individuals and they have the same sequence of base pairs, that region is identical by state. 
Um, not all regions that are identical by state will be identical by descent. So identity by descent here refers to um, shared alleles into a pair of individuals that are inherited from the same um, recent common ancestor. So you can see here in this graphic of a three generation pedigree, the two colored lines show kind of um, haplotypes of each individual and the pair of individuals at the bottom, they both inherited the orange chunk from the same common ancestor. Um, so that particular chunk of their genome is shared identical by descent and we often talk about them as IBD segments. So one summary, you can summarize how related two individuals are to each other. Um, and one way to summarize that is the probability that this pair of individuals shares zero, one, or two alleles identical by descent. These identity by descent probabilities are typically denoted by R0, R1, or R2, respectively. And you can also interpret these probabilities as genome-wide averages, right? So for example, on average, um, full siblings share um, no alleles identical by descent at about a quarter of all of their autosomal loci. So I thought I would take a moment to ask you all to do a quick thought exercise. Um, so the question I have for you is what is the probability that I share zero, one, or two alleles identical by descent with my mom? Um, and maybe folks can just put answers in the chat. And we'll just take a few minutes. So what is R0, R1, and R2? I guess you can either put the answer in the chat or like raise your hand if you have an answer. All right, I'm here. Uh, I, I guess the probability you share zero alleles with your mom is uh, 0.5 because uh, because you, you'll share one allele with your mom. So both zero and one is 0.5 and 0.5. Well, so um, you're right that you, so one thing to remember is that, um, right, you inherit so for any given locus in your genome, right, you inherit one allele from mom and one allele from dad, right? So assuming your parents are not related to each other, I should have said that. Um, so assuming your two parents are completely unrelated, if you inherit one allele from dad and one allele from mom, then what is the probability you share um, zero alleles identical by descent? with your mom at like a given locus in your genome. Uh, yep, so thank you for those who answered in the chat. Yes, R0 is zero since you have to, since you inherit one allele um, from your mom. And thank you. Uh, I also am gonna apologize in advance since I haven't learned or heard anyone pronounce their names. So if I totally butcher your name, I apologize. Um, so Sanya Tan um, is correct. Uh, so you share zero alleles. Uh, the probability that you shared zero alleles identical by descent with your mom 
or uh, it's zero, the probability I share one allele identical by descent with my mom is one, and the probability I share two alleles identical by descent or R2 with my mom is zero. Does that make sense for everyone? Or does anyone have any questions? Um, Amir, I'm not sure if you still have your hand raised or... Nope. Okay. Well, let's see how much people understood. Here's a slightly harder question. Now think about um, what is the probability that I share zero, one, or two alleles identical by descent with my brother or any kind of full sibling? Again, here, assuming your parents are not related to each other. And sorry to make you do probability really late in the day. All right, we have two answers from Gaurav and Sayatan. They're both correct. Um, so right, you each inherit um, one allele identical by descent from a given parent, but you can share an allele identical by descent with from either mom or dad. Um, so the probability that full sibs share zero alleles identical by descent is one quarter, 1.25. Um, the probability that full siblings share one allele by, by identical by descent is 0 0.5. And the probability that um, two siblings share two alleles identical by descent is 0 0.25. All right, so we can use these um, probabilities of like the R0, R1, R2 probabilities to calculate a single uh, measure of relatedness for two individuals. Um, which is called the kinship coefficient. So this is an important summary of relatedness that you often see uh, being used. And this simply refers to the probability that two alleles picked at random, one from each of the two different individuals, are identical by descent. And this kinship coefficient can be calculated as the sum of the conditional probabilities, <coughs> sorry, of two alleles being identical by descent over whether or not our individuals share zero, one, or two alleles um, IBD, right? So uh, the kinship coefficient is calculated as zero times um, R0 plus one fourth times R1 plus one half times one half, right? So, and this is because that um, the probability that a kind of random pair of alleles drawn from these two individuals are identical by descent, given that um, we know that these two individuals share one allele identical by descent is one fourth, because you have to draw um, the one allele that is identical by descent from both individuals, right? So the probability you draw the identical by descent allele from individual one is one half, and the probability you draw the identical by descent allele from individual two is one half. and so the probability you actually draw both of wheels is um, one quarter. All right, so if the kinship coefficient is calculated as one fourth times R1 plus one half times R2, if we go back to our um, questions from before, what is the kinship coefficient of a parent offspring pairs? So me and my mom, and what is the kinship coefficient between me and my brother? 
And looks like we have an answer from Nikhil. And Shuba and Sangtan, you are all correct. So the kinship coefficient for both cases is a quarter. Um, all right. Nice job, everyone. Okay. So we can use kind of identity by descent or IBD to estimate genotype probabilities, right? So let's think about what is the probability two individuals with IBD allele sharing probabilities, R0, R1, and R2, are both homozygous for the big A allele, um, assuming that this allele has an allele frequency P. Um, here, I'm assuming a biallelic locus. So we can write out kind of the conditional probabilities, right? So the probability an individual has the genotype big A, big A is equal to um, the probability that individual has genotype big A, big A conditional on, um, or the probability that both individuals have genotype big A, big A. Um, conditional on them sharing zero alleles IBD times R0 plus the same thing for R1 and R2. Um, and we can think about these, like if you think about these conditional probabilities, right? So if two individuals share zero alleles um, identical by descent, right? Then the probability that they're both homozygous for the big A allele is simply equal to the probability that they each um, would be the same as the probability of drawing the big A allele four independent times, right? Because all four alleles are independent. So we can kind of simplify this expression as um, <clears throat> P to the fourth times R naught, oops, sorry, P, uh, P to the fourth times R naught plus P cubed times R1 plus P squared times R zero, right? So if the two individuals share one allele identical by descent, then the shared allele is, of, um, is big A with probability P. Um, and then the other non-IBD alleles in each individuals, uh, in each of the two individuals also needs to be big A, and that happens with probability P squared. Um, so the probability that both individuals are big A, big A, given that one allele shared IBD is P, tense, is P cubed. Okay, hopefully this makes sense and please do interrupt if you have any questions. Um, so you can actually use uh, genetic data to reconstruct categories, um, which is useful. There are a lot of different software programs out there for doing this. Here I'm showing you some the estimated IBD probabilities of um, sharing one allele identical by descent on the x-axis versus uh, the probability of sharing two alleles identical by descent on the y-axis. Um, these are actual data from this large population of Florida scrub jays that my lab works on. Um, here, every point is a pair of individuals and they are colored by their known pedigree relationships. Right, so you can see in red that um, the dark red shows parent offspring pairs and most of them share um, one, have R1 of one and R2 of zero. Um, there's a little bit of spread here because of, because there's quite a bit of inbreeding in our population, um, which changes these IBD probabilities. And there's also noise due to the transmission, Mendelian transmission of alleles and heterozygous individuals. Um, but it's just nice to see that like all of the probabilities that we just worked through kind of work out in empirical data. And you can use this information um, to make a lot of, you know, population genetic inferences. So the kinship coefficient F, um, so far we've just been talking about probabilities for a single locus or kind of genome-wide probabilities. Um, but you can also look at patterns of IBD sharing across the genome. And the kinship coefficient F provides an expectation of how much of your genome is shared identical by descent with another individual. And so here I'm showing you kind of three simulated genomes. Um, on the left is I've colored kind of the genome by um, regions 
of the genome that are shared IBD with a given parent. Um, so we have 22 autosomes in humans, right? And the red here are colored red. And the middle is um, regions of the genome inherited from that same parent for your for a simulated sibling. And then the third panel is showing, is basically overlapping those two images. And you can see the overlapping genomic regions in purple. And so the purple regions on the right side are regions that are shared identical by descent, um, regions of the genome inherited IBD in both uh, you and your sibling. So there are a lot of different programs out there uh, that can identify shared IBD blocks. Um, and I'll put a review paper in the Slack channel so you can read more about this um, if you're interested. And we can actually learn a lot about the distribution of shared IBD blocks, right? So remember, uh, we each inherit kind of half of our genomes from a parent. And each time the genome is kind of transmitted down the pedigree, these IBD tracks are broken up by the process of recombination. So what this means is that, you know, if you have a lot of long, very long identical by descent blocks, that you can infer kind of recent relatedness from those blocks. And so looking at kind of the distribution of shared IBD blocks can allow you to infer a number of different things about the population, um, including kind of recent demographic history and also patterns of gene flow. So here I'm just showing figures from two example papers. Um, on the left is showing um, kind of the fraction of the genome shared identical by descent, or the fraction of the genome in a uh, with a shared IBD of a particular length. So these are showing kind of distributions of shared IBD blocks. For on top in panel A is um, different population different populations of constant size NE. Um, so you can see that you have for smaller NE, which is a blue line, you see you know, a larger number of individuals in the population um, sharing kind of IBD segments across all of the linked individuals. Um, and the bottom panel kind of shows how kind of the distribution of shared IBD links changes with um, kind of different demographic histories. So if there's like a um, exponential population expansion um, and whatnot, you can see how that affects kind of the distribution of IBD sharing rates. On the right is showing kind of shared um, IBD segments for individuals in different populations across Europe. Um, and you can use this kind of um, distribution of shared links to tr start to infer kind of rates of gene flow between different populations um, and also at different time scales. So, so far we've been talking about relatedness between individuals um, and IBD between pairs of individuals, but you can also think about um, IBD within a given individual, right? And so this, um, is basically the related concept of inbreeding. So inbreeding refers to matings between among relatives. Um, and the inbreeding coefficient F is the probability that a given individual, so here I'm just gonna assume we're talking about diploid individuals. Um, so the probability a given individual inherits two alleles identical by descent at any given a randomly chosen locus in its genome. So an individual's inbreeding coefficient is the same as the kinship coefficient of its parents. So there are many different ways for calculating inbreeding coefficients. Um, one way is to calculate pedigree-based inbreeding coefficients. Um, here I'm showing you a three-generation pedigree with two individuals with inbreeding, kind of severe inbreeding here. So individual E is a product of a full sieve mating. On the right, I'm showing you kind of the pedigree drawn from a family history perspective where we're showing kind of um, mating events and offspring. Uh, but sometimes when you're trying to think about inbreeding, it's a little bit more useful to draw the pedigree um, from a genetic transmission perspective where 
Um, you just use the arrows here are just showing kind of which individuals are passing alleles on to which uh, individuals down the pedigree. So if we're interested in calculating the inbreeding coefficient of individual E, um, the first thing you do is to look for potential common ancestors. So in this case, um, individual E has two potential common ancestors, individuals A and B. Um, and what we're interested in doing is calculating the probability that individual E inherits two alleles identical by descent from any common ancestor. And so one way to do this is you can highlight potential paths by which individual E could inherit two alleles identical by descent from either ancestor A or ancestor B. In this case, it's a fairly simple case where it's, there's just two possible um, inbreeding loops, right? So two possible ways that individual E could inherit two alleles identical by descent. So let's take a look at um, the probability individual E inherits both and in two alleles identical by descent from ancestor A, right? So um, for purposes of illustration, let's just pretend that ancestor A is a heterozygote. Individual E can inherit either allele identical by descent from ancestor A, so um, can either inherit the big A allele or the little A allele twice. Um, and here, again, remember, that the probability ancestor A transmits the big A allele to a given offspring is 0 0.5. Um, so you can then, looking at these paths, calculate that the probability individual E inherits either allele identical by descent from A um, is as 0 0.5 to the fourth plus 0 0.5 to the fourth, right? Because there are four different meiosis events. Um, but individual E can inherit either allele identical by descent. So we just add up the two probabilities. So this is equal to 0 0.5 to the third. So note that this probability is the same as 0 0.5 raised to the number of ancestors um, in the kind of inbreeding loop path that I've drawn out here. So we can calculate a pedigree-based inbreeding coefficient by um, simply adding together the probability of inheriting two alleles identical by descent from all of the possible common ancestors um, an individual has, and we just add those probabilities together, right? So for this example, um, individual E can inherit two alleles IBD from in two possible ways. Um, and so its inbreeding coefficient is equal to 0 0.5 cubed plus 0 0.5 cubed, which is equal to um, 0 0.25. So in general, for diploid individuals, you can calculate the pedigree-based inbreeding coefficient um, as the sum across all paths of one half raised to the power of um, n or the number of ancestors in the ith path um, times one plus uh, the inbreeding coefficient of the common ancestor. In most cases, if you don't have any information on the common ancestor, you just assume that they are not inbred. So you assume that their inbreeding coefficient is zero. All right. Um, hopefully that made sense. Now, why don't you all, this might require some pen and paper. Here's a question for you. What is the inbreeding coefficient of individual I in this category? So remember the first step is to figure out how many potential common ancestors this individual has um, and to draw out the different paths by which um, individual I can inherit two alleles identical by descent. Um, and then calculate the probabilities of each path and add them up. And if you don't have a calculator, you could also just write out the expression. 
Um, let's start with identifying potential common ancestors, right? So these are individuals who could potentially pass on two alleles to individual I. Um, so I'm seeing a number of different guesses and Farhan is correct. Um, so individual A and D can have the ability to pass on both of their alleles to individual I, right? So here um, you're looking for ways to draw loops or circles, um, like individual E, right? Cannot be a common ancestor because individual E can only ever pass on one allele to individual I. Um, that's the same for F and H and B. So there is inbreeding here. So B could potentially be a common ancestor for both alleles in G, but since there's no other, since I must inherit one allele from H, um, there's no way for individual B to pass on. Um, kind of, if there's no way for individual I to inherit two alleles um, from individual B. Okay, so knowing that there are two potential common ancestors, A and D, the next step is to figure out all the possible ways um, that individual I can inherit two alleles identical by descent from a given, from either individual A or D. Uh, yes, Katyush, you have a question? Do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Pratyush? Hello, uh, am I audible now? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I think there's some issue with my mic. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I uh, can, could you please explain again how we are how we are determining which ones are the common ancestors? So B, uh, I didn't clearly understand why B is uh, not a common uh, ancestor because I, I thought it, it's part of two loops. So yeah, I, I, could you please explain that? Yeah, um, so we're looking for, indiv so um, an individual, can be a common ancestor only if there's a way that B can pass on two alleles to individual I, right? So I is inbred if it inherits um, the same allele twice from a given individual. Um, so B, if you look at this pedigree here, um, can you see my mouse if I'm Covering. Yeah, it's a bit small, but it's visible, yes. Okay, so if you look at the pedigree, um, B can pass one allele, transmit one allele to individual E and one allele to individual F. Um, e transmits one allele to G and one allele, and F also transmits one allele to G. Um, so it is possible for G to inherit two alleles identical by descent from B to inherit the same allele from B twice. But individual I, because I gets one allele from G and one allele from H, and there's no way for H to inherit an allele from B, then that means that I like the probability individual I can inherit two alleles identical by descent from individual B is zero. So B is not a potential common ancestor. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, yeah, thank you. So essentially that would amount to saying that uh, the any common ancestor should be able to pass on uh, one uh, allele either directly or indirectly to the parents of uh, the individual we are looking at. Uh, would that be yep. the case? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. They would need to be able to pass on one allele to both parents. Yeah. So, okay, I lost my mouse. Um, where is my mouse? Oh, here we go. Okay. So, the next step, right now that you see the common ancestors, um, so and common ancestors A and D, 
the next question is to figure out how many ways, so how many kind of loops can you draw in the pedigree in which individual I can inherit kind of two IBD alleles. So for D, um, and these loops, right, all have to start with one parent and end with the other. So I'm just gonna go um, clockwise for now, for simplicity. So individual I, right, inherits one allele from G who can in inherit one allele from F, um, who inherits one from D who can transmit one to H and back to I, right? So one of the inbreeding loops is here. So G, F, D, and H. Um, based on this loop, right? So there's uh, one, two, three, four ancestors in this loop. So the probability that I, individual I inherits um, two alleles IBD from D is equal to 0 0.5 to the fourth. Okay. Um, so, what is, so thinking about um, common ancestor A, what are the, what's the probability individual I can inherit um, two alleles identical by descent from A? And so one, one way to do this is to like draw out the paths um, and then calculate the probability for each path. Right, so just the room of for ancestor D. So for common ancestor A, there's two paths. What are the two paths? Two ways I can inherit, individual I can inherit two alleles I can do. Uh, yep, that's right. G E B A C H is one correct path. What is the other option? Yep, Pratish, that's correct. Um, so Individual, okay, okay, here's one that, sorry. Um, uh, Amir, that's right. So GFDH is a path for individual I to inherit both alleles identical by descent from D, that's correct. For ancestor A, there's two possible ways. Um, Individual I can have the inherit two alleles I, IBD from individual A. Um, and one way is to go kind of G to E to B to A to C to H and back to I. And the other way is G to F to B to A to C to H and back to I. Okay, so there we've drawn out three different ways that um, individual I can inherit two alleles IBD. Um, so given those three paths, what's the formula? Like, how would you write out um, what is the inbreeding coefficient for individual I? Um, 
So the paths are G E D A C H. Oops. All right, we have two guesses for inbreeding coefficient. Um, one thing to remember is that you take the sum of the paths of one half raised to the power of the number of ancestors in the path, not including your focal individual. So um, Farhan and Sachin, you're close. Um, so if you look at the first uh, probability from D, it should, uh, there are four different ancestors, right? So it should be 0 0.5 to the fourth plus 0 0.5 to the sixth plus 0 0.5 to the sixth. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions? So the good news is there are R packages now where you can input a pedigree and it'll just automatically do all of this math for you. Um, but I figured it's a good uh, exercise just to make sure you understand what the inbreeding coefficients are really calculating. Um, so moving on, unless there are other questions. Um, so far, we've talked about how to calculate inbreeding. Um, so inbreeding, right, is if basically if there's a lot of inbreeding in a given population, that means that individuals, right, have a non-zero probability of sharing both of their alleles identical by descent, which if you remember from a few slides back, will increase the probability that individuals are homozygous. Um, and so that then kind of alters genotype frequencies in a population. So if you think about kind of your typical Hardy Weinberg uh, genotype frequencies, um, they would actually be different uh, if there was inbreeding in the population, right? So most of you have probably learned that kind of the Hardy Weinberg genotype frequencies are p squared, 2pq, and q squared. Um, but there's, we can generalize these um, genotype frequencies to incorporate uh, inbreeding, 
So here, if S is the inbreeding coefficient, right, we know that inbreeding increases um, the frequency of homozygotes and decreases the frequency of heterozygotes. And so you can kind of tweak the, your classic Hardy-Weinberg uh, genotype frequencies to incorporate inbreeding for the generalized Hardy-Weinberg. So then in a population with inbreeding coefficient F, um, the at equilibrium, your like expected frequencies of the big A, big A genotype is equal to P squared plus PQ times F. Um, heterozygotes are go down, frequency of heterozygotes is decreased by 2PQ, and um, the frequency of the alternate homozygote is increased by PQF. Yes, there's a question. Uh, Nancy, I didn't understand why you, how you add the extra term PQF to the hardy weinberg equilibrium frequencies. Uh, what do you mean by how we add it? So um, inbreeding is a phenomenon that increases homozygosity. Um, and this, the way you get PQF is similar to the um, ideas that we, uh oh, oh my God, my computer's frozen, sorry. Spinning wheel of death, this is not good. So earlier, right, remember how we talked about how you can estimate genotype probabilities um, if you know the probabilities a given individual inherits zero, one, or two, this slide. Um, identical by descent. So we're using kind of the same, oh, sorry. And let me go forward. I'm really sorry, my laptop is very unhappy with me right now for some reason. Um, but the basic idea is that it's, like an individual, right? So the inbreeding coefficient tells you something about the probability, like the inbreeding coefficient essentially tells you the probability a given individual has two alleles um, inherited identical by descent, right? Um, and so kind of using the same concept as um, kind of what we talked about on this slide, right? Then uh, we can calculate kind of how much that changes expected genotype frequencies um, in a population if we know kind of the inbreeding levels. Okay. Does that make sense? Because like if an individual shares, two alleles identical by descent, um, you could either sample the, and you can sample the big A allele with frequency P, or if it shares um, Yeah. Does that make sense? I guess. Okay. So, Another thing too to note is you can, if you calculate the expected allele frequency of the big A allele um, from using the generalized Hardy-Weinberg genotype frequencies, you get um, the frequency of the big A allele in the next generation is expected to be P. So inbreeding by itself, inbreeding or non-random mating, right, will increase the proportion of homozygotes and change genotype frequencies, expected genotype frequencies. But it is a, by itself, um, inbreeding does not is not expected to change allele frequencies over time. So we can calculate inbreeding coefficients from genetic data, um, and a lot of a common approach. Kind of the basic idea behind these kind of genetic based estimators of inbreeding coefficient is to look for a decrease in observed heterozygosity, right? So, one way you can calculate inbreeding, the inbreeding coefficient is, to, is, as, is equal to one minus the 
observed heterozygosity divided by the expected heterozygosity under Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Um, there are many different uh, estimators of inbreeding coefficients, and now with kind of more and more um, genomic data collected in natural populations. Most folks are moving away from the pedigree based estimators that we spent a lot of time on um, to using genomics to estimate inbreeding coefficient. And one of the advantages of using genomic data for estimating inbreeding, if you can do it, is that genomic estimates uh, give you an estimate of the realized inbreeding coefficient which are more accurate than the pedigree based estimates. So what this means is that um, the calculations we did on the pedigree, right, we're assuming that a parent kind of, you just have perfect transmission probabilities of one half all the way down the pedigree. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that the genome is actually inherited in chunks and haplotypes and um, the size of the trunk that's inherited through time is broken up by um, recombination. There's like this randomness, right, of the process of uh, Mendelian, of meiosis and Mendelian transmission basically means that there's going to be a little bit of um, noise, right, around how much of the genome you actually inherit uh, from a given ancestor. So, we can kind of illustrate this. So here I'm showing you um, on the right, on the left, um, I'm showing you kind of actual genomic relatedness estimates for um, several thousand full sibling pairs of individuals. Um, so remember, full sibs are expected to share on average half of their genomes um, with each other. And you can see that there's a uh, you, well, you actually look at kind of how much of the genome is actually shared. So the realized um, IBD, uh, there's, you can see it's a normal distribution centered around a mean of 0.5. So there's a lot of variance um, around the actual estimated genomic relatedness. And then on the right, I'm showing you um, these here, each point is a given individual. Um, and the x-axis is the pedigree-based inbreeding coefficient, and the y-axis is um, a pedigree or inbreeding coefficient estimated from genomic data, genomic F. Um, and you can see here that the two estimates are fairly correlated, but there's a lot of spread, right? So these genomic estimates are a lot more accurate because they give you the actual realized F. There are a number of different estimators out there um, for estimating F using genomic data. Many of them kind of use proportion of the genome that are that's um, homozygous or less heterozygous than expected based on you know, party number um, equal expectations. Uh, but right now, at the moment, if you have a good genome assembly and sufficient um, gen sequencing, then the best method actually is the statistic called FROH, which is equal, is calculated as the proportion of the genome and runs of homozygosity. Um, so a run of homozygosity would be, so if you have, for instance, a particular region in your genome, you can uh, measure heterozygosity along that region. Sometimes you'll see chunks that are completely homozygous. These would be considered runs of homozygosity. So this has like direct parallels with IBD segments, right? So here in this case, we're just looking for kind of IBD segments within kind of a given individual. And um, the same thing the same types of information that we can learn from shared IBD segments between pairs of individuals, we can also learn from looking at kind of the distributions of um, runs of homozygosity within an individual, right? So if there's very recent inbreeding, then there wasn't as much time for recombination to break up inherited haplotypes. So you would expect to see very long stretches of runs of homozygosity 
Um, so you can, if you have enough to know data right now, a lot of folks are kind of characterizing runs of homozygosity across the genome, and you can kind of learn a little bit about the timing of inbreeding events from looking at the distribution of these ROH links. All right, um, and then I wanted to end really briefly with why do we talk so much about inbreeding and why do we care about inbreeding? And that's because of inbreeding depression, which is a fairly common, common phenomenon in like a very widely focused um, topic in conservation. So inbreeding depression is this phenomenon uh, of reduced fitness in inbred individuals compared to non-inbred individuals. Um, and it's pretty common when we see inbreeding depression in a number of different populations. Um, we don't have a great understanding about the genetic architecture of inbreeding. So there's kind of three main uh, potential causes of inbreeding depression that I'm showing you here. Um, so basically this like lowered, reduced fitness of inbred individuals can arise either because these individuals have more homozygosity um, and so they may have more, are recessive deleterious mutations that are actually expressed. Um, so the top row and the middle row are both kind of increased homozygosity and deleterious mutations with recessive effects causing these homozygotes to have lower um, fitness. Or it's also possible that um, individuals have lower fitness because um, they have lower fitness at over dominant loci. So if there are loci that exist where with heterozygote advantages, where the heterozygotes have higher fitness than either homozygote, then inbred individuals are going to have reduced fitness because they will have lower fitness at any over dominant loci. Um, we don't have very much information right now about kind of is inbreeding depression caused by a few alleles of large effect or many, many alleles of smaller effect. Um, but I think we're finally at a stage uh, where we can start to learn about the genetic architecture of inbreeding depression, which is really exciting. So I just wanted to end with two fun examples. Um, one of the most extreme examples of inbreeding and inbreeding depression in humans is Charles II of Spain, um, the last of the Habsburgs. So here's just a uh, snapshot of um, the pedigree of Charles II. If you look, there's just like inbreeding loops everywhere. Um, once I made the mistake of asking my students to try to calculate the inbreeding coefficient of Charles II. Turns out it's very, very hard. Um, and I learned my lesson to never ask that question again. Um, there was a recent study that looked at, so you can, so one, the inbreeding pedigree-based inbreeding coefficient of Charles II, we don't have genomic data for the Habsburgs, um, is very high, it's 0 0.254. Um, and you can see evidence of inbreeding depression here. They're showing, um, the probability of survival to 10 years um, for different uh, relatives of Charles II with increasing inbreeding coefficients. And you can see kind of decreased survival um, over time. Shuba, did you have a question? Oh, sorry, I have to lower my hand. Oh, okay, no worries. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't ignoring you. Um, and then there was a recent paper, which I'll put in the chat because I quite like it touches upon a lot of um, kind of the most up-to-date work in inbreeding repression. So they did a bunch of genome-wide sequencing and looked actually characterized runs of homozygosity across the genome for several different stoa sheep. Um, and they found evidence of inbreeding depression. Here I'm showing you um, the predicted survival probability um, as a on the y-axis as a function of inbreeding coefficient on the x-axis. So here they're using um, FROH, so the proportion of the genome uh, in a run of homozygosity as their inbreeding coefficient. And the different colored lines uh, show survival for different life stages. Um, 
So you can see here that kind of survival is decreases with higher inbreeding coefficients. And also um, the slope of the line, so the strength of inbreeding depression kind of decreases in later life stages. So there's much stronger inbreeding depression at early life stages. Um, this result kind of the, the result showing that the strength of inbreeding depression changes throughout life and tends to be higher at earlier life stages has also been found in a number of other species, including birds. So to quickly summarize what we went over today, um, there are a lot of population quantitative genetic concepts that rely on relatedness among individuals. We didn't talk about those concepts that much, but we touched upon how to, the basics, so how to calculate kinship and inbreeding coefficients and how to estimate genotype probabilities using um, these IBD probabilities. Um, you can learn a lot about demographic history and whatnot from looking at the distribution of IBD blocks across um, pairs of individuals or the distribution of runs of homozygosity within individuals. And then inbreeding depression is very common, but we still know very little about its genetic architecture. Um, so what I'll do uh, later today is I'll share, if you're interested in learning more about these topics, I'll put a few review papers in the Slack um, so you can read them on your own time if you're interested. And then I thought what we would do for the next, well, I guess first I should ask, are there any questions about what I just talked about? And if not, what I thought we would do is um, break up into breakup rooms and work on a couple problems, um, kind of applying some of the stuff we just talked about. So first, any questions?